Good evening. Tim Pullen here, coming to you again from the Parsonage at Lakeview Church of the Nazarene on this Wednesday, February the 17th. Hope you're having a good day today and hope that you're ready to worship the Lord tonight and to learn from His Word. The stone to flesh again converts the veil of sin again removed. Sprinkle thy blood upon my heart and melt it by thy dying love. This rebel heart by love subdue and make it soft and make it true. The stone to flesh again convert the veil of sin again. Sprinkle thy blood upon my heart and melt it by thy dying love. This rebel heart by love subdue and make it soft and make it new. Stone to flesh again convert the veil of sin again removed. Sprinkle thy blood upon my heart and melt it by thy dying heart. This rebel heart, thy love subdue, and make it soft, and make it move. The stone to flesh again convert the veil of sin again removed. Sprinkle thy blood upon my heart and melt it by thy dying love. This rebel heart my love subdue and make it soft and make it I wonder how many of us recognize what this is. I would say it's a good chance most of us recognize what this is. It's a, a bottle of water. Bottled water. Who would have ever thought a hundred years ago that people would spend billions of dollars on bottled water? <clears throat> this water is called pure aqua, P-U-R aqua. It says it's purified water with minerals added for taste. And on the back of the label it says that uh, this is purified by reverse osmosis. Now I looked reverse osmosis up and I uh, discovered that it basically it is when water is forced through a membrane so that the impurities in the water are removed as it passes through that membrane. That's a very simple layman's uh, translation of what I read about reverse osmosis. And, uh, and yet we 
we spend, like I said, billions of dollars on this water. Now, uh, the water from your tap at your faucet, if you're not on a well, if you're on town water, city water, <clears throat> uh, it's it's been purified also. It may have gone through a, a sort of a reverse osmosis or some other kind of osmosis process to uh, cleanse it and purify it from harmful contaminants as well. And it's probably had a couple of things added uh, to help with that process and hopefully with the taste as well. <clears throat> but we, we value purity so much that even though we're paying to have water come to our faucet, we'll go out to the store and we'll buy these in packs of anywhere from uh, 6 to 48, I think, as the most I've ever seen in one pack at a time. And <clears throat> it gets to be where you can't even <laughs> bring the water in the house almost because those packs can be so large and heavy. But we value pure water. We value purity in general, don't we? And why is that? Because we know that impurities can cause problems. It's that simple. Impurities cause problems, and purity helps to avoid those problems. In the message today, we'll be looking at uh, Matthew 5, 8, where Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I wonder if I was to take this, uh, this bottle of pure water, go out in the front yard, grab a handful of dirt, and just drop a few little grains of that dirt into this water and slosh it around. How many, how many of us would be more likely than before to want to take a drink of this water? What if I put half a handful of that dirt in there and sloshed it around, or, or a, a whole handful of dirt? in that water and slosh it around till it became all muddy and murky looking. How many of us would want to drink from it then? Well, if we're not careful, we can allow the same thing to happen to our hearts. We can allow one little tiny bit of impurity to get in there, or maybe a few grains at a time, or half a handful at a time, metaphorically speaking. And before long, our hearts have become impure. And that pure impurity has to be dealt with. We're going to be talking about that today as we go along. And I invite you to join us on this journey as we look at the next installment of the Beatitudes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I'd like to start with a word of prayer, if you'd allow me. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for all you're doing for us, for all you do for us every day. For all that you have done for us throughout history and throughout our lifetimes. Tonight, Lord, uh, I especially want to remember uh, our friend Jenny, who's in the hospital. She's struggling, Lord. She's got a lot of things going on. And it's not certain how things are going to turn out right now. So, Lord, I pray for her. And I pray for her family and all those who love her. I pray, Lord, that you will give grace and that you will give mercy and that you will give your peace to all those who are affected by what's happening in her body. Lord, uh, in, in my limited wisdom and insight, I would ask that you would heal her in Jesus' name, that you would demonstrate your power, your strength, your mercy, your love for your child and restore her to health and demonstrate your grace and your glory through her body in this way. But we ultimately lean on your wisdom and your good judgment and the promise that you gave us that you work all things together for the good of those who love you. Help us, Lord, to love you and to trust you to do what is best <clears throat> and be with the family, which whatever happens, Lord, and Help them to know that they are not forgotten and that they too are loved and cared for during this time. Lord, we also want to pray for all of those who have lost loved ones. Uh, there's some, been some high-profile deaths uh, just the last 24 hours that have uh, made many of us very sad. <clears throat> you know who those people are. You know how it's affected us and 
and how so many things that have happened in this world in the last year have affected us. And Lord, we just, uh, we need your grace. We need your help. We need your mercy. We need your love. And Lord, uh, we ask that you would provide these things in abundance as you promised you would. All of the resources of the universe are at your disposal, Father. And we know that you do work all things together for good to those who love you. So help us to love you so that we can claim that promise for ourselves. Be with us tonight in this time that we share. Speak to our hearts and to our minds and help us to understand what it means to be a part of your kingdom. And we will thank you and praise you for all that you do, for we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Purity, as I said, is a sort of a touch word. It's used a lot in advertising to help sell products. There's no end to the number of things that are pure. Clean and pure laundry detergents and clean and pure soap and clean and pure water and clean and pure everything. And natural. That's another touch word of the day that is used a lot in advertising because people assume that something that is natural is pure. It may help to remember that that manure is natural that it's not necessarily pure, depending on what kind of purity you're talking about. So natural doesn't necessarily mean pure, but people today tend to think that natural means pure because that implies that there have been no chemicals added, it hasn't been processed uh, in, in some way, by human hands because obviously if it's been touched by human hands it's been made worse in some people's estimation um, which I don't believe is always the case but Jesus said that blessed are those who have had their hearts purified through a catharsis Siri tells me that a catharsis is a purification and purgation I may be mispronouncing that purgation purgation of emotions, particularly pity and fear, through art or any extreme change in emotion that results in renewal and restoration. Interesting that pity is included in that, isn't it? I wonder why would we want to be purged of pity? Um, well, that's their definition of catharsis. But Jesus is saying that. Those who have gone through a catharsis of the heart, a purgation of the emotions, if you will, um, to have our emotions cleansed, purified, um, made new. That might be a good way of describing it. These are the ones that Jesus says are blessed because they will see God. They will see God. What a promise. Because if you recall in the Old Testament, especially in, up until the time of Jesus, the understanding was that no man can see God and live. When Isaiah did see God high and lifted up in the temple, and the angels flying around crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, Isaiah cried out in terror because he thought he was dead. He was a dead man. He said, I've seen the Lord and and I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips, and, and I, my eyes have seen the Lord. I, I'm a dead man. <laughs> Woe is me, he said. So, um, only the pure of heart can see God. I'm reminded uh, of the childhood tale. I guess you would call it a, a parable or a, a fairy tale that uh, talked about the little girl who was the only one in the crowd who uh, remarked that uh, the king was walking around without any clothes on uh, because the king had been convinced that this man could spin silk so pure that only the pure of heart could see it. Well, who was going to admit that they couldn't see it because that would prove that they were not pure of heart, including the king? He didn't want to admit that he couldn't see it either. So this this tailor spun uh, and and created this imaginary set of clothes for the king to wear and 
So the king, the word got out that the, the these clothes are are spun and made from the silk so pure that only the pure of heart can see them. Well, everybody in the kingdom then pretended to see the clothes, except for one precious little girl who was too young to be impure. And so she asked the question, why is the king walking around without any clothes on? And then the people realized that they had all been duped by this man. But purity of heart really is essential if we're going to see God. At least that's what Jesus seems to be saying on the hillside that day. That if you really want to see God, your heart has to go through a catharsis. Your heart has to be cleansed of impure emotions and feelings and desires. And as powerful as the idea of purity is today, it was much more important to the people listening to Jesus on the hillside that day. They had many traditions and religious rules and rituals that had gone back for centuries to help them to become pure and to maintain their purity. And, and it was really a full-time job for them to do so. It was hard work, and it required attention, great attention to detail. Long before medicine recognized the health benefits of washing our hands before eating, observant Jews who were faithful in their uh, purity, uh, would follow a schedule to wash their hands multiple times a day. It reminded them of the importance of purity in their relationship to God. Now filling everyday life with practices uh, used to remind people of God's holiness and his call to be a holy people is one of the reasons that the Jewish culture has survived when the cultures around it have all but vanished or been drastically transformed into something that would be unrecognizable by the people living in Jesus' day. It is a model for effective religious education. When Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, most of his Jewish audience that day would have smiled and thought, Well, this blessing is certainly mine. Jesus' followers would have instantly identified with this beatitude. They had heard this theme over and over again in their worship. Uh, the question was asked, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? <laughs> Only he, he who has a pure heart and a clean conscience. But what comes to your mind when you hear the word pure? Uh, what items would you include on the list of things that must be pure for you. We talked about water. What are, what are some of the other things that have to be pure? Your food and so forth. Uh, any number of things may come to mind. How does impurity then affect the essence of something in your sight? If this water had a handful of dirt in it and it was washed around, um, it would become murky and muddy and, and undesirable to drink. What are some of the other things in your life that uh, would be undesirable if you knew that they were impure? What about relationships? When a husband or a wife discovers that their spouse has been unfaithful, impurity has entered the relationship, and, it's, and it taints the relationship, and it makes it unpalatable in many cases, and uh, uh, it, it can destroy marriages that can destroy ha families and, and households. So purity is important in other aspects of life too, other than physical things. It's, it's important in our relationships as well. And what relationship could be more important to us than our relationship to God? Because that relationship includes every other relationship that we have. So I wonder what kinds of things do people do to avoid uh, impurity in their lives? What kinds of things do they do? What kinds of things do they not do in order to have purity in their lives? Well, we talked about washing hands. We talked about drinking clean water. What are some of the other things that we do to make sure that the things that affect our lives are pure? They're not going to be harmful. 
And it, that brings up the question, is it, is it even possible to live a pure life in this day and age? And if so, why? And if not, why? Is it really possible to be pure 100% of the time? <clears throat> I think it, there's a reason that Jesus talked about the purity of the heart. Because there are many times when we make uh, mistakes. We set out to do one thing, and either the outcome of that thing is different than what we intended, or something happens along the way and, and we offend someone, we hurt someone's feelings. Uh, it wasn't the intention of the heart that these things would happen, but that's what, that's what ended up happening. Now, is that something that we did on purpose? Is it, is it a sin? I mean, we fell short of the intention, but does that make it a sin for which we must repent and ask God's forgiveness? Certainly, if we've hurt someone, we should ask that person's forgiveness, even if the, what, what we did was, was unintentional, that, uh, it, that it was not intended to hurt them. We should still apologize for the fact that they were hurt. But the Lord knows our heart. All the way back to the days of Samuel, when Samuel went, <clears throat> when Samuel went to anoint David, who would become the king of Israel. All David's older brothers were marched in before him. David was still out in the field watching the sheep, and all of his brothers were marched in, paraded in front of Samuel one at a time, starting with the oldest and working their way down. And each time one stood before Samuel, God said, no, that's not him. No, that's not him. Until finally all the sons, except for David, had paraded past. And Samuel said, is that it? Is that all you have? And Jesse said, no, there's David, but he's just a little boy. He's out in the field watching the sheep. Samuel said, bring him in here. And uh, God told Samuel, you know, all these older, stronger, strapping young men, would have appeared to have been more viable candidates, so to speak, for the job of king. But God told Samuel, I don't look at things the way people do. Because people look on the outside, but I look on the heart. And David was called a man after God's own heart. Because he was a shepherd. He was faithful. He was out in the fields watching the sheep. He was it's taking care of the ones for whom he had been given responsibility. And that's the kind of person that God wants to be his leader. And David would go on to be perhaps arguably the greatest king that Israel as a nation has ever had because he understood the importance of being faithful and loving the sheep and caring for the sheep. He wrote the 23rd Psalm, which is, a beautiful description of God who is our shepherd and takes care of us in so many ways. So God looked at David's heart and said, that one has a pure heart, a heart that I can work with. And it's important to have a pure heart. It's purity in general is a good thing. We, Like I said, we, we talk about the purity of water, but what about the purity of the things that we put into our hearts? David the psalmist asked, how can a young man keep his way pure? The answer is by guarding it according to God's word. What about the impurities, however, that are already there? What about the impurities that are in our hearts from times past? And that's why Jesus, I believe, used this term catharsis, or from which we get the word catharsis, to describe the heart of those who will see God. Because we are all born sinful, as David uh, commented in, in a psalm that we'll be talking about shortly. So there's a need to recover purity that has been tainted and lost. There needs to be some sort of a reverse osmosis for the heart, like there is for water. A catharsis that cleanses us of the impurities that have gotten in there over time. As I just said, David was 
known to be a man after God's own heart. And in most ways, he, he was the greatest king that Israel ever had because he loved the Lord and he did everything he could to be faithful to the Lord, except for that one time. And if you're familiar with your Bible, and if you're familiar with the story of David, you know what I'm talking about. That that one time when he when he had an illicit relationship with a woman who was married to another man. And in order to cover up that sin, he ended up having the woman's husband killed in battle. He put him at the front of the line where the fighting was the fiercest, and then the men around him were ordered to withdraw so that he would be struck down. This was a terrible, terrible sin and cover-up in God's eyes. And David thought he had gotten away with it until God's prophet Nathan came to him and exposed him for what he was. And David had to choose then how he was going to respond to the fact that he'd essentially been caught with his hand in the proverbial cookie jar. And rather than deny it, which is kind of the human inclination at times like that, David confessed his sin, and he begged for God's forgiveness. And Psalm 51 is a record of this prayer for forgiveness to the Lord, and I'm going to share that with you now. David said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Sounds like a catharsis, doesn't it? <laughs> For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Did you notice in this prayer that never once did David ever ask, tell me what I can do to make this, this right, God? No, <laughs> he was relying solely on the grace and the mercy of the Lord and in God's ability to cleanse David from his iniquity. He said things like, have mercy on me, wash me, cleanse me, teach me, purge me, wash me again, hide your face from my lips, blot out all my iniquities, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away, restore to me the joy of your salvation, uphold me with a willing spirit, deliver me from blood guiltiness, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Who's doing all the heavy lifting in this scenario? It's God. It's not David. David's only contribution to the effort was to acknowledge his sinfulness and to acknowledge that the only thing he has to offer is brokenness of spirit and his contrition. And contrition simply means the state of being remorseful and penitent.
So being pure in heart means being morally upright, being honest, being genuine, being trustworthy. These are people who are pure of heart are people of character and devoted to the following God and his word. Those who commit their lives to God strive <clears throat> those who commit their lives to God strive to live morally in the things they say and do. It is purity from the inside out. Why is purity on the inside necessary in order to live purely on the outside? I wonder, is it possible to have purity of action without really being pure of heart? Why do you think purity of heart is part of the Beatitudes? In many ways, it seems like purity of heart is a sort of a summation of everything that Jesus has said thus far in the Beatitudes. Let's look back at it and see. Let's look back at it and see. Matthew 5, beginning at verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And then we come to this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And all of these earlier Beatitudes seem to be included in this concept of, of having a, a pure heart, poverty of spirit, you know, mourning. That's, that's sort of a catharsis in itself, isn't it? Uh, being meek of heart and hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That's a heartfelt desire. Uh, being merciful is, is an act of the heart. It's an act of love and, and uh, compassion. So Jesus is almost summing up what he has said to this point. And it all has to do with what's going on inside the person's heart. Now, John, the evangelist, wrote in 1 John 3, 1 through 6, he said, look with wonder. This is the Passion Translation. It's kind of fresh and, and new. He said, look with wonder at the depths of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. He has called us and made us his very own beloved children. The reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize him. Beloved, we are God's children right now. However, it's not yet apparent what we will become, but we do know that when it is finally made visible, we will be just like him, for we will see him as he truly is. And all who focus their hope on him will always be purifying themselves just as Jesus is pure. Anyone who indulges in sin lives in moral anarchy. For the definition of sin is breaking God's law. And you know without a doubt that Jesus was revealed to eradicate sins. And there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in union with him will not sin. But the one who continues sinning hasn't seen him with discernment or known him by intimate experience. Wow. That seems to be talking about heart purity to me. I wonder why believers are considered to be children of God. What do you think the writer meant by the reason the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know him? There's this, this family uh, resemblance that is going on between God and those he has caused to be reborn in his image. We bear his image. Now, it may not be a perfect reflection of his image. I, I have often had people uh, say to me, I'll never be able to deny John Lewis as my son because 
he looks so much like me and and he tends to act a little bit like me too and that that can be good and it can be not so good at times but um there's a family resemblance there my uh college pastor uh, dr dan boone now the president of trevecca nazarene university my alma mater uh once talked about uh the the spitting image that that phrase the spitting image and where does it come from that uh, spitting image simply means that, that it's a knockoff it's one just like uh, this boy's just like his father and uh, he talked about the etymology of that word the spitting image and he said actually it's kind of a an abbreviation of the phrase the spirit and image spirit and image over time be, was basically shortened to spit and image, spirit and image, spit and image. And uh, he said that we were created to bear the spirit and the image of God. When God breathed into Adam, Adam became a, a living soul, a living being. And uh, he was stamped with the very image of God, not just in his physical appearance, but in his internal appearance and in, in his spiritual appearance, children tend to look like their parents. Uh, so when the writer talks about the fact that those that don't recognize us because we don't belong to this world and we don't live and think and act like the people in the world do, uh, and they don't understand why that is, they don't know where that's coming from, it's because they, they don't know God. If they knew him, if they knew Jesus, they would understand why we live, think, and act the way we do. You know, that brings us to a very poignant question. Do people in the world recognize you as being one of their own? Or do they recognize that uh, there's something different about this one? They don't react the way other people tend to react under stressful circumstances. They the, you know, the, the things that bother them are not the things that bother the rest of us, and the things that bother the rest of us don't seem to have any effect on them. Does the world not recognize you for where you come from? Do they, have, do they ever wonder, maybe even ask you, what is it about you? You're so different than other people that I know. Uh, I would never be able to react the way you're reacting in this situation. I hope that that's the case because that's proof positive that you bear the spirit and image of your father in heaven. You belong to him. You're his child. Now, in that passage that we read, there was a reference to those who belong to the father purifying themselves. Uh, do we make ourselves pure? And if not, then how is that purity possible? Well, uh, you know, from time to time, as an illustration, uh, Karen and I will go out to, to grab a bite to eat at lunch. And it almost invariably happens uh, that uh, whatever we're eating, part of it ends up right about here on my shirt or, or maybe on her shirt. A uh, little piece of taco meat will fall and land right there and it's all greasy and it's, and it's ugly and... So what do we do? Well, um, if we thought ahead, we have one of these things called Tide pens. It's, it's just a little, it looks like a pen, and you compress it, and it releases just a little bit of Tide detergent, and you can use that to kind of wash that little spot away and make it less obvious, and in time it'll dry, and you'll never know there was a stain there. So when there is a need for purification, we go to the, the source of purification. Uh, when it's a really bad stain, we'll have to come home, change clothes, and spray it with spray and wash, and throw it in the laundry, and hope it'll come out. <laughs> but what about spiritual purity when our hearts have been tainted and our spirits have been made unclean? Where do we go for, clean, for cleansing? Well, there's only one source, and that's the blood of Jesus. And that that is the most powerful cleansing agent ever known to any being in the universe. It is the blood of Jesus. It cleanses the deepest stain, the deepest sin. 
and makes us pure and holy and makes us and restores that family image in us. The, day, the psalmist prayed, David prayed, re restore a right spirit within me. Hmm. Restoring that image of God. So, so why do believers, as John said, stop sinning? Well, because we belong to the Father. It's, uh, it's kind of, it kind of becomes our nature. <laughs> it's not our second nature, it's our first nature. Uh, our, our natural born first nature is to sin, to give in to temptation when it comes. We learn from the time we are just babies uh, we are being taught not to give in to those inclinations. Um, and as we grow in, into maturity, hopefully we have learned to control ourselves and not give in to every little impulse that comes our way. And, and those that don't learn that end up causing a lot of damage and harm and hurt in people's lives. And that's, that's the nature that we're born with. But when we come to Jesus and we ask him to make us new, to make us clean, he does just that. He, he transforms that nature, that nature through this catharsis of the heart. He transforms us into the new condition in which that inclination to give in to sin, to temptation, is no longer our first instinct. Our first instinct is to be repulsed by it because we know that it would be displeasing to our Father and we love Him and we don't want to do anything to harm Him or to hurt our relationship to Him. So it changes our first instinct from being giving in to temptation to resisting it. So you may be wondering, well, how does this work in the life of a Christian, in the everyday life, and in what ways does being a believer mean living a life of sinlessness, and is that even possible? And does it mean that we have to try to be perfect in every sense of the word? Well, let's talk about that word perfect for a second. It's a, it comes from a Latin word, perfectus, which means that something is unable to be improved upon. Okay, it's, it's the absolute pinnacle uh, ideal of whatever it is that you're talking about with regard to perfection. But that is not the language that the New Testament was written in. Originally, it was written in Greek. And the Greeks didn't use the word perfectus. They used the word teleos, from which we get words like telescope and telemetry and things that, that are far off but they're, they're objects, they're, they're objectives. And tel telemetry and teleos has to do with, with reaching a goal or, or achieving a purpose or fulfillment. It also has a sort of a cyclical connotation of, of bringing something to completion, bringing something full circle. Uh, the Christian, the, the New Testament Greek understanding of perfection, what is translated perfection, is actually fulfilling your purpose, reaching your objective, finishing the telemetry of your life and God's intention for your life. Now, by that definition, perfection is going to look different for everybody because God's intention for you, the potential that he has placed within you, is going to be different than mine. His purpose for you is going to be different than mine. Uh, the things that he wants you to accomplish, is, that list is going to be different than mine. So, as we talk about purity of heart, and as we talk about this catharsis of the heart, and the cleansing of the heart, uh, we're talking about the heart, which is the source of our love. And remember, Jesus told the, the person who asked him what are the two greatest commandments, he responded by saying, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if the heart is the seat of our loves and our emotions, then being pure in heart means that we love God the way we should, and we love others the way we should. And by doing those things, just those two things, Jesus said, all of the law and all the prophets are fulfilled. And by doing those two things, we obtain our objective. We, we come full circle. We reach the, the level of completeness and fullness that God intended for us. And we are the children of God that he intended for us to be. Jesus made this all possible by laying down his life for us, by allowing his blood to be shed on that cross. And we're told in Revelation that, that believers who overcome do so by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. It is the blood of Jesus that washes us and cleanses us and makes us new. There is a catharsis moment. There, there seems to be a moment in each person's life who comes to Jesus where they say, I don't want to live like I've been living anymore. There's pressure. <laughs> and that pressure is, is pushing us through the membrane of faith in Christ and purifying in the process, removing from us those impurities, those impure thoughts and acts and intentions and desires. They're being... They're being purified so that what comes out on the other side is a new creation. As Paul said, if a man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old is gone, the new has come. And all this happens as a result of Jesus and what he's done on the cross. The good news is, the God who wants, desires, and expects us to have pure hearts if we want to see him, is the God who created us. He gave us the hearts that we have. And you might say he is the ultimate heart surgeon. He is the only being in the universe who really can transform a human heart and make it from what it has been into what God wants it to be. He has the blueprint, you might say. He has the diagram. He knows how it's supposed to work. And he can fix us by fixing our hearts. <laughs> he can transform not just the heart itself, but, but the very person that we are into being the person that he wants us to be. I have experienced this. I can very clearly point back to a moment in, in my life when I stopped being one person. And I started being another person with God's help. Because I was convinced of the love of God. As John said, behold what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us. That we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. I was convinced that God loved me, even though I was not really very lovable at the time. And it was that awareness that finally enabled me to let go of the things in the past that, that had dragged me down and that had prevented me from loving him, from loving others, and frankly, from loving myself. And from that moment on, the telemetry of my life changed. And I began to walk in a different direction with God. I'm not perfect by the Latin sense, but I have come to completion as uh, it, as far as it relates to loving God and, and loving others. Am I perfect in that sense? No, not all the time. But um, I'm growing still and moving in that direction. And someday I'll either step out of this skin on my own or he'll come and take me home and and he'll finish the, uh, finish the work that he's been doing on me. He can do the same for you. I hope you'll let him. Let's close with a, another word of prayer. Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for your word to us tonight. Thank you for this hopeful promise of Jesus that those who have pure hearts can see you. He didn't say blessed would be, except it's not going to happen. He said blessed are. It's a present tense reality. It's, it's attainable. It's achievable. It's, it's possible. It's not outside of the realm of, of conceivability. That we can actually see you. That we might actually have a heart that is made pure. And if David's prayer is any indication, we know we can't get there on our own. You're going to be, have to be the one that does the work. So right now, we turn to you and we ask you to do that work, Lord. Purify our hearts. Cleanse our minds. Restore us in your spirit and image. Perhaps a spirit and image that we have never sensed before. But make it so. Make it true. Make it real. Make it present right now. As we live in this world with all of the problems that it brings. Lord, if we have hearts that are not pure, we're not going to make it. I think of the, the analogy of, of a metal worker, a blacksmith, pounding on that heated metal to, to knock out the impurities so that when that metal cools and it comes under stress, it will be able to stand up to the test because those impurities, if they were in there, would cause it to shatter. Lord, I think of that analogy, and I can't think of a better one, perhaps, of, of the catharsis that we go through. Life is happening. We are being stretched and pushed and squeezed in so many different ways than we ever have been before. We don't know what's coming around the next corner either. But Lord, we believe that you can even use these situations in our lives as that pressure that pushes us away from the life that we have known and from that self-driven, self-oriented life into a relationship with you that doesn't just change who we are, but it changes the nature of our relationships to those around us. Lord, make it so tonight in your people. Transform us, Lord, and then use us as agents to reach out to others so that you can transform them as well. And as we do, one soul at a time, this world can be transformed as well. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise for all that you do. For we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for watching tonight. I hope that this has ministered to you. And I hope that uh, you will seek that pure heart if you don't already have one. And if you have one, thank, thank the Lord for it. And do everything you can to maintain that purity. And I hope to see you again real soon. Bye-bye. You're. Have a good day.